Hey kids, uh, my guest today got her start in public service in the early 80s as a community activist out west, and eventually, and I found this most fascinating when I was researching you before the last election, the leader of the Manitoba arm of the Communist Party of Canada. Bravo, it's part of why I voted for you. <laughs> uh, in 2003, she, uh, she was elected here in Toronto to Toronto City Council, where she has served ever since, and she is currently the councillor for Ward 14. Please welcome to the Handsome Genius Club, Toronto City Councillor Paula Fletcher. Hello, Ms. Thank Fletcher. Thank you. Great to Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. Uh, Absolutely. I, I have wanted to talk to you probably since the last municipal election when our benevolent leader forest uh, <laughs> uh, city council to reduce from 47 to 25 seats correct uh, in fact the only people who are fighting this move are a small group of left-wing counselors along with a network of activist groups who've had they've entrenched themselves in the power under the status quo over the years in retrospect, what, what was your opinion of that decision at the time, and how do you think it's working out now? That was just a shock, but not so much because uh, our benevolent leader has always wanted to control all the politics in the city, mm -hmm. and we always called them twin mayors when his brother was the mayor. So finding that he had all this power at the province must have just been so exciting for him and um, this was an attempt to really take away a lot of the power uh, which has happened mm -hmm. make life a little more difficult for counselors and perhaps easier for lobbyists and developers and others because it's very hard to stay on top of absolutely everything right the um, you know I come from a small town in Sault Ste. Marie its population is 70,000 people I have more constituents in my riding, in my ward, than my old hometown. I yeah. have 111,000 <laughs> constituents, and my hometown has 70. So every time I see that population sign when I drive into it, I think, oh my God, what did he do? Uh, <laughs> and we know what he did. Yeah. And, and how do we think it's working now, though? Do, I mean, you say it's hard to keep on top of everything, which of course it would be. And there was much talk at the time about uh, the pressure that was going to be put on council staff. And uh, but I wondered, is the business of the city be getting done? Uh, well, the business of the city is getting done, but the one of the roles of councillors is oversight, mm -hmm. and it is um, hard to have the degree of oversight that we might like to have. Also, we have a lot of agencies, boards, and commissions. Yeah. We've had to reduce the number of councillors uh, with their oversight, such as on Toronto community housing mm -hmm. and other places where you really need to have a strong component of councillors because we are representing the shareholder. So I just think uh, the other thing that's interesting is we have COVID right in the middle of it. Right. So we don't really know exactly how that would all be rolling out because everybody's been pushed to the sidelines uh, under the emergency. You, uh, you mentioned uh, housing uh, in the city, and I know that particularly um, here in my own neighborhood, there are uh, a, a handful of buildings where people are involved in rent strikes or rent protests because applications are being made for uh, AGIs, for uh, above... Uh, above standard, increased guidelines. right? Yeah. Above, above guideline increased guidelines. increases yeah. to, to their rent, and this is in the midst of what was supposed to be a rent freeze in Toronto. I think the last number I saw was that before the the year before the uh, pandemic started, there had been forty such applications, and uh, since the pandemic started uh, in the last year, there have been more than ninety. Uh, so it seems like. With that loophole, people are trying to get around the rent freeze by applying for AGIs. Have you been involved in any of these uh, with any of these groups that are are protesting? Have you been in contact with any of the landlords? I've been in contact with tenants, and uh, typically, 
uh, when there is an above increase guideline, I will go out to the building with the Federation Municipal Federation of uh, Tenants Association, Feder Metro Toronto Federation of Tenants. Yes. And we will meet with the tenants, explain how they get a grant to fight the above increase guidelines because they are really, uh, they're a really clear requirement in order to have an increase. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, very happy to do that. I've been on Cosburn quite a few times and Gamble quite a few times and meeting out in parking lots and, and during COVID <laughs> even um, and supporting tenants uh, with the rent strikes and everything else also very active around rent evictions because this yeah. is really something that wasn't happening much before but wow uh landlords are buying whole buildings and then throwing people onto the street saying they're they need to go because they're renovating the building and then of course they're just going to raise the rent not really renovating the building right well i mean that, that again coming up to the last municipal election that was a concern of mine here in that my building was sold for the first time and apparently in about 30 years and uh i've been here now for 11 years so the difference between my rent and the starting rent for this apartment is right. is large it's significant <laughs> yes. yes and so they do try to drive people out um at that don't know they have the right to return. If someone says they're going to renovate your place, you have the right to return after. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to get a new bylaw like they have in Westminster, BC, mm -hmm. which will stop the rent evictions because these are all affordable rents like yours mm -hmm. and others. And we're hearing from people when Acorn have meetings, what's happened to them when they uh, moved. Yeah. And now they're having to pay triple the rent in a new place mm -hmm. and they wish they'd stayed put and fought it. Yeah. So I'm always here to help people fight injustice. Fantastic. That is <laughs> wonderful to hear. Um, just yesterday, as we're recording this on Friday, it's going to go out on Monday, but just yesterday, uh, city council voted 27 or excuse me, 17 to seven to uh, change the name of Dundas street after you know, a, a year or so of uh, intense reevaluation of the uh, the legacy of Henry Dundas. You voted yes on that. Dundas, a name ubiquitous in Toronto, soon to be no more. The item is amended carries. Toronto City Council voting today to replace it. You can never go wrong doing the right thing. What do you think of changes like this? Are, are there more coming to the city? And uh, what was your thought process going into that vote? Well, I think there will be some more coming to the city. I was there on the walk for the kids that the, whose bones have been found. Mm. And we went to Ryerson. Uh, I left 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, Ryerson statue came down. We're in a time of really great change. Right for social justice, dealing with the the history of the past and the unfairness of the history of the past, what's gone on in our country, what's gone on around the world. And so uh, I believe that the renaming of Dundas really caught fire mm -hmm. because of the death of George Floyd and then discovering that Henry Dundas never lived here. He was just named that because he had was in uh, I guess Simcoe was somehow had to <laughs> please him in some way. Uh, so it, there's no real connection. And then it turns out he actually prolonged his actions, prolonged the slave trade. Right. So no matter how you try to fix Henry Dundas, it's really hard to do. And I spoke at council and talked about Queen and Logan actually was a very well known stop and part of the Underground Railroad that we have so much local history of, of champions, of heroes in our neighborhoods that don't have streets named after them. Mm -hmm. Why we need to rethink na this name, Dundas, and perhaps some of the other ones. I'm quite affronted by the Sir John A. Macdonald Plaza yeah. at Union Station. I did ask some questions about that, and I'll probably start, continue that vein of questions because it was done with the snap of a fingers. Mm -hmm. And I think the Indigenous Affairs Committee and the Indigenous community has to have a look 
and tell us if we did the right thing or not. I didn't support that at the time, but it was a majority vote of council. And I'm assuming that you're uh, also supportive of uh, the move to change the name of Ryerson University. Uh, I, I Let's see what happens. Uh, it's a very big change to change Ryerson University, but you know, I just read that uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, they've taken him down in Scotland. Mm -hmm. They're not giving him any platform. That around the world, people are repudiating those leaders mm -hmm. that do not have the values that we have today and were part of a very dark chapter yeah. in the history of our country and other countries. I, I've heard, uh, I heard a news report yesterday that uh, changing uh, the name of Dundas Street could cost the city uh, four to five million dollars. Uh, is that a is that a correct estimate? I think it's going to cost money mm -hmm. because you have to. There's a lot of legal documents right. for all the buildings that are along Dundas and the businesses that are along Dundas. So, mm -hmm. but you know, I don't think we should let money get in our way to right the wrongs of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the reason I ask about the estimate for the city is. Um, the businesses along Dundas that will have to be making these changes. Uh, is the city planning any kind of compensation fund for uh, legal expenses for the businesses that are going to be having to make changes to you know their legal documents? No, I, I, we've cut, we're a look at that, but we have to change all of our legal underpinnings mm -hmm. and everything so uh it's going to be a long process because we're still going out for consultation now right. as you know it was not changed yesterday but yeah. i can't wait to change dundas uh and dundas actually through a good part of my ward actually never existed previously it mm -hmm. was built maybe 40 years ago 50 years ago and it was called apple grove that was the name of the street. So maybe we can go back to that historic. Name. I I was about to ask. Do you have any personal uh, preferences for what the street might end up being called? Well, I think we'll have to ask about the history of that section. Dundas did not go all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of going through the ward and of uh, Doug Ford, uh, Ford has uh, been a heavy influence on the plans for what is now being called the Ontario line, the subway line, uh, which I mean, for years was just known as the downtown relief line that never got built in the 80s. Good evening, a massive transit announcement for Toronto as the province and city reach an agreement in theory. In a nutshell, Mayor John Tory has agreed he will support Doug Ford's Ontario line. In exchange, the city gets to keep control of its subways, which the province had been threatening to take over. We have defended our TTC. We have found a way to move forward on transit expansion. It is being portrayed as a win-win. The city keeps control of subways and the province builds the Ontario line. Premier Doug Ford's jewel in his nearly $30 billion transit plan, which replaces the city's previously planned relief line. The ambitious promise for the Ontario line is that it will run from the Science Centre to Ontario Place at a cost of $10.9 billion and a completion date of 2027. And, and that line cuts straight through uh, Ward 14. Should Leslieville residents in particular be worried about what the above grade portions uh, of, of this subway line are going to do to their neighborhood? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, these neighborhoods, you know, everybody's very big transit. We have streetcars that squeal all night. We've got everything going. Uh, everybody's a big transit booster. They all take transit. They know about transit. No problem. But this, remember the downtown relief line, it actually before 2018 election of the Ford Conservatives, actually had an approved plan to be underground. It was a TTC project. Mm -hmm. Doug Ford said, TTC, I'm taking everything away from you. We will do everything through Metrolinx. They threw, ripped up the, uh, the plan for the downtown relief line yeah. and put everything on their tracks. The reason why it cuts right through 
the ward is because we have railroad tracks that cut through there, Go Transit. Go Transit is expanding to four tracks. The Ontario line will be another two tracks. Uh, there will be a great amount of impact from this because you know, just think about building it. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The number of trees that have to come down, the impact leader, the big walls that are going to have to be built there. And then recently, we understand they have to raise the track bed completely by six feet, the entire thing for the above ground section. And all of the five bridges that are across Eastern, Queen, Dundas, Logan and Carlaw, they all have to be completely rebuilt. Wow. This is not a small project. And every time there's something new that creates a greater and greater impact for the community, a negative impact. For mm -hmm. the Other than putting more money in somebody else's pocket, what is the what is the benefit of uh, or what is what are you being told is the benefit of the current Ontario line plan? Oh, well, we know there's a benefit to having a relief line. The relief, Ontario line is the Doug Ford relief line yeah. um, taken away. So really to move people off the young subway line, yeah. right? This is so crowded. People tell you they're standing there waiting three and four and five trains in order to just get on a train. Yeah. So we know it's needed, but seriously, um, when you think about the impact of putting it above ground, you might rethink and say, let's go back to the original plan, yeah. which is a below ground and did not have the impact. Yeah, that that, w that was the intention of my question is Those the Ontario line versus the previously approved plan by the TTC. Uh, I, well, I, what, yeah. what could, what could you have been told? What could city council have been possibly have been told that makes the Ontario line plan better than the originally approved TTC plan? Well, city council, even though we've had all transit planning removed from us, except mm -hmm. for signing an MOU saying that we'd like to have rapid transit, mm -hmm. city council has said bury that section of the line yeah. and review the community's plan, bury that section, stop with the impact. So I have so many motions asking, what's the impact on parks? What's the impact on transit? What the existing transit? What's the impact on traffic? What's the impact on, on trees? What's the just impact on creating chaos? Right. Um, it's very hard. Metrolinks doesn't say, yes, we're going to create tremendous chaos. But I think when we look at it, we realize that this is this is going to be hellish, actually, yeah. should they proceed. Uh, is there a timetable for shovels in the ground on this project? Like every Doug Ford project, it changes. It's changing. Yeah. Later, later. It's always going out by six months, and then, oh, we're not ready. It's another six months. Yeah. You know, the Scarborough subway was voted to happen in 2013. Mm -hmm. That's eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow nothing's happened. Right. So it's just when you when you have such grandiose plans, but they're very hard to do, yeah. then everything will be late, actually, just the way of the world. Yeah, as evidenced by the Eglinton Crosstown. Yes. Yeah. It's a, yes, we need to be more realistic. You know, you announce something and everybody thinks, great, that's going to happen. It takes years to get things implemented. Yeah. And particularly with transit, uh, napkin transit doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. It's got to be engineered transit, not back of the napkin. <laughs> very well said. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, as, uh, as their plans are being formulated as they're coming together. Uh, are th do we know of plans uh, with the Ontario line to expropriate any existing homes or businesses? Is that going to end up being part of the plan? Oh yeah, there, I believe there will be expropriations of mm -hmm. homes and businesses. There would have been with the uh, below ground as well. Mm -hmm. the, you know, building transit in a super dense, already built up city, putting the transit through there that's very hard to do. Yeah. Uh, 
Let me just catch myself here. There will be a station at Pape and Cosburn somewhere. We still don't know exactly where. And again, what the impact is of on that. Yeah. Um, it. I hope it doesn't serve to uh, just drive all the rents up. And what it really does is allow people to get on rapid transit. We will be seeing what happens. Well, personally, right at, at the corner of Pape and Gamble, there is what is now an empty lot, which for years was a gas station and a, a like a four uh, a four shop little strip mall. And I think that's the shoppers' drugs now. That yes. was intended to be uh, the the owner of what was Pape Subs uh, told me before uh, before he closed down that that was it was going to be a new building for Shoppers Drug Mart. Right, but that doesn't seem to be happening, and I wonder if that bit of land, if somebody has given somebody you know the elbow to say that that bit of land might end up being. Uh, a transit station so don't build anything there because we're just going to knock it down could be i'll have to check that's you could have hit the nail right on the head I, i'll be checking <laughs> i'd i'd love to know i'd love to know because i'm close enough my building is close enough to pave that i am going to hear a lot of construction in a few years right so. <laughs> yeah. um with the city reopening today more businesses more gatherings uh, being allowed. Do you have any opinion on how the city and or the province has done with this uh, managing the, 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 the shutdowns and reopenings and especially this third wave? I think people just want to know what the rules are. Yeah. They want consistency. The businesses want to get open as quickly as possible in the safest way as possible. And everybody's pretty excited. We really are... Um, waiting until we get a certain saturation point Mm -hmm. for vaccines before we can fully or you know open fully for first and second doses so that's why i asked for that clinic that was yesterday at pape and cosburn because Mm -hmm. the rates are actually fairly low along cosburn and gamble in that apartment neighborhood area Mm. so um i'm very committed to getting those rates up so we can all get back to something that's far more normal are uh, are you or are, is the council concerned about the possibility of a, a fourth wave and what it might mean for the city? I have heard from our intrepid chair of the Board of Health, Joe Pressey, that there could be a fourth wave in the middle of September or, you know, mid to late September. Mm-hmm. It would all, not be the big delta that we normally have, the big spike, but something, some kind of little fourth wave as this uh, vac- as this pandemic kind of uh, peters out mm-hmm. and there's enough vac- enough people have been vaccinated. If we don't get a high vaccination rate and meet the targets, then yes, I think we're probably in for the fourth wave. If we can get people out, particularly those people that haven't had access or are a little reluctant mm-hmm. or don't speak English, aren't too sure, uh, then I think we can get to a point where we can perhaps stem off the fact that there would, might be a fourth wave. Are you, now that things are starting to reopen, uh, is there anything in the ward that you're looking forward to <laughs> this summer? Any, I, I don't think we're going to have Taste of the Danforth this year. No, nope. uh, <laughs> no festivals. Yeah. No festivals. Uh, it, I think uh, I love to kind of sit outside. I think that's great. I love looking at the Danforth. It's so animated with Destination Danforth and all the cafes. It's mm-hmm. spectacular. Mm-hmm. I think like a lot of other people, uh, in-person shopping, I just want to go in and touch a few things instead of just looking at them online. <laughs> that is, I've talked to a lot of people that feel the same way. Just the fabric, the touch, the yeah. feel, the smell, everything. It, it, this normal shopping experience, it's great to be able to have things delivered right to your door but it doesn't take the place of the clerk the the person who owns the store the clerk however you're going to have those relationships they are social relationships shopping is a social relationship and i'm looking forward to uh, maintaining and rekindling some of mine 
How how do you feel about the news that uh, Toronto FC is going to be allowed to play games in that? Uh, we might be looking at the the Blue Jays coming back to the Rogers Center uh, for at least part of their season. Is is this a good idea? I think it. You know, it's not up to me. It's up to our MOH and mm. the province and everything else. But we shouldn't do things too quickly. I just was watching the ticker go by yesterday and see that quite a few sports teams have a lot of positive COVID cases. Yeah. Uh, and uh, before we wrap up, I, I told uh, my subscribers on Patreon that I would, I would honestly be letting myself down if I did not ask you, how does young Paula Fletcher become the leader of the Communist Party of Canada in Manitoba. <laughs> How, honest, to, honest to goodness, I had been living in this ward for uh, eight years before the wards were combined and, uh, and the new municipal election, the last municipal election. And I, I took the time to research the people in the field. And uh, just a perfunctory uh, perusal of your wikipedia page when i struck upon that line i said okay well my vote is decided because i need to know that there is somebody in city hall representing this ward that when when big money comes for the little guy somebody will put it in effort on the little guy's behalf and I, um, reading up on you, I trusted that you were that person. But I'm fascinated by how did you become the leader of the Communist Party of Canada in Manitoba? I have to know. Well, for the very reason you just said. Well, look at all that money. Look at the little guy. Uh, Manitoba and Winnipeg had a very, very... Uh, Oh dear! Oh They're, no, sorry. you're back. No, that's fine. I'm back. Uh, long history of left-wing representation, mm -hmm. left-wing city councilors uh, in the legislature as well, and uh, very strong anti-discrimination um, policies. Working with First Nations, working with Indigenous communities. I worked forever on solidarity with the ANC in South Africa. All through that. So those were all the people that were doing that work, mm -hmm. and I came in to that, and then became the leader. Uh, young Paula Fletcher, older Paula Fletcher, is still uh, fights injustice, <laughs> uh, stands up for the little guy, fights for tenants, um, doesn't like to see big money try to roll in and do whatever it wants, defends our waterfront, so it's all for us, not just for the wealthy. I am all about making sure that everybody has their fair share and fair shake fantastic well i for one very much appreciate the fact that however it happened i now get to have you as my representative in city hall and i am very grateful to you for taking the time out today to talk to us in the handsome genius club and i am very happy to have met you and to talk to you <laughs> and uh you know where i am if you're running into problems up there for sure thank you always very here much. thank you okay great bye now bye